This special edition of CES Tech Talk is brought to you by Abbott. Abbott is a global healthcare company with leading products in diagnostics, medical devices, nutritionals, and medicines. Their breakthrough technologies are redefining our approach to diagnosing and managing some of the world's greatest health challenges, helping people live healthier, fuller lives. Hey, everybody. I'm Tyler Suters with the Consumer Technology Association. We are the owners and the producers of CES, the world's largest, the world's most influential tech event. And we are here to help you get CES ready. CES 2020 is coming up January 7th through the 10th in Las Vegas, as always. Today, we are talking to a major player in this space, Abbott. This is a company that is bringing life-changing health technologies to those people who really need them. Um, think about this. Something as straightforward as removing the pain of regular finger sticks for diabetics who need to test their blood. Or something as broad as connecting patients and doctors with real-time information. And that can be monitoring your heart rhythms and health, maybe easing chronic pain, or even addressing movement disorders. A broad, diverse conversation today with Abbott's experts across cardiovascular health, diabetes, and product development. All of that is coming up on this special edition of CES Tech Talk. Joining us today from various parts of the country, a triumvirate of experts from Abbott. First of all, Heidi Hendricks is Divisional Vice President for Global Clinical and Regulatory Affairs at Abbott Cardiovascular. And Heidi, great to have you with us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Joel Goldsmith is the Senior Director of the Digital Platform for Abbott Diabetes Care. Joel, we're glad you're with us today. Thanks for having me. And finally, Ryan Lakin is Divisional Vice President of Product Development with Abbott Neuromodulation. Ryan, great to have you here. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Let's start with a bit of a group question, and I, I want to keep it broad to begin before we really drill down, but we have so many major medical challenges, both as, as a nation and you know, across the world right now. Let's begin with just a bit of a state of play regarding the medical devices, the technology helping these areas that are really at the intersection of technology and, and consumer-facing technology and the treatments, the therapies involved. And Heidi, let's start with you. Oh, sure. Thank you. You know, over the last few years, I think we've really seen an uptick in terms of the intersection of medical devices with consumer technologies because it's really helped us manage some complex health conditions. And at Abbott, I think you'll hear my colleagues talk about in their space how it's, how they're managing uh, more complex health conditions as well through the use of consumer technology. One example we have in our cardiovascular portfolio is our insertable cardiac monitor. It's our Confirm RX. Uh, product. And this actually monitors people's heart rhythm 24 hours a day, seven days a week for up to two years to really detect abnormal heart rhythms. And the, the way that is actually interacting with a consumer technology is that we have an app that we can upload onto a patient's smartphone. And that app collects data from that person's in, implantable cardiac monitor and then will actually transmit to a website where the physician can monitor this patient's abnormal heart rhythm. And so that, would, that way, that allows us to monitor patients remotely without requiring them to carry handheld transmitters, without requiring them to go into the physician office. And that's how consumer technology has truly helped in our cardiovascular space. Joe, let's go to you next because I think that diabetes care is... Um at the forefront of something Heidi touched on, which is having a physical monitor. It's, it's, a, it's a real touch point uh, for diabetes patients at the intersection of, of consumer tech and treatment. Yeah, I mean, uh, diabetes is uh, broadly recognized as one of, sort of the, the uh, showcases of the potential for digital health. And it's not really a surprise when you consider the magnitude of the condition globally. It's a, a growing global epidemic that currently affects an estimated 425 million people and as many as 30 million people living in the United States. 
uh, in its simplest form, the, the disease can be described as impairing the body's natural ability to regulate its blood glucose. So monitoring glucose is really a fundamental part of managing the condition. And the devices that have been used to manage diabetes have always resembled consumer electronics. But in the past few years, the convergence between the two has really advanced. And, and I think uh, it can be described uh, around sort of three fundamental shifts that are occurring in diabetes technology in general, but in glucose monitoring in particular. The first from traditional blood glucose test strips that have been around for decades and for many years were the standard of care for monitoring blood glucose from a droplet of blood to body-worn sensors that are now making it possible to capture dense glucose data. The second, really the shift from proprietary handheld devices that have been used to monitor glucose to connected consumer electronics, primarily phones and watches, that are serving as the primary user interface. And then the third is really uh, the shift from isolated desktop software that's historically been used as a form of clinical decision support to distributed cloud-based services that will really enable new forms of clinical decision support that's powered by advances in machine learning. So I think you can tell from, from, uh, from the other two, it's an exciting time for health technology. And as we start a new decade, uh, we're at a transformative time in medical technology. Technology is becoming a natural part of who we are and how we manage our health. Uh, we are at the tip of the iceberg from our perspective at Abbott. We're at the forefront of addressing some of the world's most prevalent and costly and difficult managed chronic diseases, um, including the ones that we already talked about, heart disease, diabetes, and then in our neuromodulation businesses, specifically chronic pain and movement disorders. In the neuromodulation business, we're studying and developing new technologies at Abbott that will help us identify new innovative solutions that fit seamlessly into the patient's lifestyle, uh, but also by allowing them to discreetly manage their pain using consumer technologies that we have today. And these are to manage implantable, what we call active implantable devices using things such as Apple, Apple mobile devices uh, and Bluetooth wireless technology, and then also beginning to leverage artificial intelligence as well. So, you're, Brian, you're bringing up an interesting point uh, about the, the pace of innovation, and especially in the, the greater digital health space. Um, thinking back over the last 10 years, talk about the evolution uh, in technology here. And you know, I, I want to keep in mind that 10 years ago, the, you know, the iPhone was nascent, self-driving vehicles, drones, uh, not yet you know, remotely deployed uh, to the scale they are now. And even voice recognition has has come so far in that decade. So, Heidi, let's start with you. I mean, what what have you seen as, as far as the growth, the exponential evolution within your space in 10 years? It's been pretty phenomenal. If I look at my role in developing clinical trials and therapy, new therapies in the cardiovascular space, what we've seen, if we look back, let's just start with taking the basic pacemaker and looking back 50 years. In the past 50 years, a pacemaker really hasn't changed in terms of its uh, current form factor that it has. But in the last 10 years, from a technology perspective, we've gone from only being able to capture basic battery information about our pacemaker over the telephone to today's world, which is collecting significant diagnostic information that the physician can then access allowing them to truly understand how well that device is performing on that day for that patient and how well that patient is responding to that therapy. So we're getting real-time information through the newer technology that's been developed just in the last 10 years. And Joel, you already uh, delved into that somewhat um, regarding the diabetes sector when you're talking about, and I'll use some of the shorthand here, but going from um, test strips right? Actually pricking your finger and, and, and doing a manual blood test to full-time glucose measurement monitors, right? Yeah, I mean, that's probably the most notable uh, advancement in the last decade is that uh, body-worn sensors that are used to continuously monitor glucose have now really started to become mainstream. 
and uh, our product, Freestyle Libre, is now used by over 1.6 million people in 46 countries. Uh, this is in a category that essentially didn't exist a decade ago. And then more recently, of course, the emergence of mobile medical apps that operate on phones and tablets and watches. They fulfill the primary intended use, and they're treated as medical devices, even though those apps are running on consumer electronic products that themselves are not regulated, nor are their operating systems. So that's a, a pretty fundamental change. And then one other, uh, I think, is worth noting that, that has a little less to do with the product itself, but is equally as important, is our ability to capture and analyze real-world evidence now on a global basis. And this is uh, quickly becoming sort of a, uh, an expectation of the clinical community, of the payer community. And because of the tools that I've been describing that are persistently connected, it gives us the ability to capture data, analyze it on an aggregated and de-identified basis, and really demonstrate the, the clinical effectiveness of it. So just as an example, with the Freestyle Libre system that I mentioned, we've been able to show that people are, are using that uh, routinely on a daily basis around 11 times per day. Mm -hmm. Ryan, what about your view specifically from product development within the last decade? Yeah, I think um, from our perspective, it's you have to start with the, with the reality that millions of people live with pain and pain is a complex chronic condition that people in, with it endure it for a long time, uh, really without adequate relief from both. I think what people think about a lot is the physical symptoms, but the psychological symptoms are really um, paramount to that population. Many times, and in many times, the psychological symptoms are actually greater than that of the physical pain in terms of quality of life. Therefore, as we think about what we've done and how the market has evolved uh, over the last 10 years, leveraging digital and wearable technologies such as physiological sensors, including insights from implantable devices, wearables, health data, even contextual information, can be brought together to create really unique solutions improving overall quality of life. Um, people living with chronic pain are really now able to control their system with a very consumer-friendly um, solution that leverages the iOS platform. Um, and with some of our latest innovations, we have a strong opportunity to really address some of that needs with people living with chronic pain. And so, you know, in conclusion today, more people are getting implanted because of kind of not having to think about the chronic condition and more importantly, not thinking about the implanted device they have uh, for both pain and for movement disorders for people with Parkinson's disease as an experience. And because these positive experiences, really more people are coming into the market um, due to ease of use. And so uh, as we kind of find increasing importance uh, for people to share their experiences and as health becomes something that people manage more themselves, um, the stories and the positive outcomes are really allowing uh, more people to, to have access as well as gain the benefits of technologies that Abbott offers. So, Ryan, that brings up a good point when you're talking about the patient side uh, of this equation as technology has evolved so rapidly. Um, Heidi and Joel, where do you think that people, patients, are in terms of their willingness to engage, to try, to be connected full-time? In other words, are they, are they wide open to this brand new technology that helps them monitor, that keeps them more connected with their physicians and, and, and healthcare um, uh, providers? Is there still something of a hill to climb there, or are we more broadly embracing it you know, year by year? Well, certainly in the cardiovascular space, we have found patients, people embracing this. And it was, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because as a society, we feel the need to be connected more and more these days. Um, we are at, at, at certainly in the cardiovascular space, the majority of our patient population is Medicare age, Right. However, even if I look at my grandparents and my parents, they're also connected uh, with smartphones. And so as you think about our society aging, this is going to become more and more prevalent. And certainly today with our ConfirmRx remote monitoring technology, this has been highly positive. Uh, patients are using it because they feel like they're more empowered and more control, and more control over their cardiovascular health. 
and that they're using a tool that they use in their everyday life and every aspect of their life. I mean, certainly Joel's going to have uh, a lot more experience with uh, the free cell Libre. Yeah. Joel, is, is the cell to patients as simple as this is easier, this is better, this keeps you healthier? That's certainly part of it. Uh, you know, diabetes is largely a self-managed disease. So people that are living with this condition day in and day out uh, are forced to confront it, whether they like it or not. And uh, I think the adoption of new technology is sort of, it, it, it has benefited from the halo effect that's been created by uh, the popularity of consumer electronics like phones and watches and tablets that are now used by billions of people worldwide daily for lots of other reasons. So the, the adoption of products like that are actually uh, benefiting us because we're utilizing the user experience and the development platforms that those provide. In terms of uh, you know the, cre- the connection that it creates between patients and healthcare providers, that's part of it. But uh, it's as much about personal empowerment as it is about facilitating the flow of information between people and their healthcare providers. Mm. Um, so I think that it, it's sort of both of those benefits. Uh, certainly, the, the clinical community is benefiting from making those what tend to be pretty short-lived in-office encounters more productive. And and that's by simply automating the process of capturing data and then transforming that data into actionable information, Mm -hmm. which allows the clinician to focus more on the interaction with the person that they're, they're working with rather than simply spending time acquiring the data converting the data into something useful uh, and then, you know, when they have only a few minutes left, trying to translate that for use by that individual. Mm. Um, Ryan, I want to be clear. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. This evolution isn't purely organic. So much goes into the R&D process. Um, Given your role on the product development side again, can you walk through the process over the last 10 years or just the process that's in place now as far as developing this technology that changes lives so profoundly? Yeah, happy to. So, you know, neuromodulation has been around for several decades at this point, but we're seeing a larger number of companies that are really coming into the space. And obviously that always drives innovation, competitiveness, and at the same time, awareness and interest in in our space and and other spaces within Abbott as well. Um, And so that really forces us to think about innovation and stretch the boundaries for how we do it. And so the importance of, of research and development is paramount to Abbott. Um, for to to really make life changing technology, and so a few years ago, I'll take an example. A few years ago, uh, scientists. So in our organization, we have um, neuroscientists doing a lot of amazing work on on how the body works, uh, and engineers studied and developed a new method to really think about how do we use less energy um, for our implantable devices, and so less energy translates to less power requirements. And so for our devices that are implanted, they have batteries uh, that power them. And so if we can be more efficient with power, uh, we ultimately can allow those devices to last longer and people gain benefit for a longer period of time. Um, and then also study new waveforms. Really waveform is kind of how the, the stimulation or electrical pulses are delivered um, to the area of interest for us. And so to really mimic the natural responses to things like pain. So as a result of that, that work that we started a few years ago, we were able to develop and actually we just launched recently a couple months ago uh, what we're calling the Proclaim XR system, which is really a breakthrough solution uh, for people living with chronic pain. And it, it's really different than any other pain device on the market. It, and for the 50 million people just in the United States who live with chronic pain, they're really looking for new options that provide them um, the relief they need. And so the Abbott Proclaim XR system uses um, a very low energy uh, burst DR stimulation. As I said, the stimulation are these electrical pulses that can be dosed without sacrificing the efficacy um, of pain relief, which is really amazing. Uh, Additionally, people with these devices no longer need to recharge their device. And so really a lot of solutions on the, on the market 
require people to be reminded that they have a chronic disease uh, and charge their devices. And so by able to, to really reduce power requirements and maintain efficacy, um, people can really seamlessly integrate these solutions into their life, uh, really allow, allowing them to live without this, as I said before, this constant reminder um, of chronic pain. And we really just started rolling out these devices, but they really received positive feedback from physicians as well as the people that have been, been implanted. Uh, and in some clinics, there's actually waiting lists uh, for, for these solutions. All right, Ryan, I'm glad you bring up the Proclaim XR. That's a great gateway into some of Addict Abbott's products that are really changing the game right now. Um, and if we could do a bit of a lightning round, and if I could send a product to each one of you by name and let you talk about the development of it and how it's really helping people in the marketplace right now. And uh, Ryan, let's stay with you um, and talk a bit about DBS. Yeah, so for, for deep brain stimulation, so DBS stands for deep brain stimulation. It's really used um, for people who uh, are living with Parkinson's disease or also essential tremor. Um, and so we're looking at a lot of things from computer brain interfaces in conjunction kind of with artificial intelligence to really help people with Parkinson's disease and essential tremors and, and things like new lead technologies, um, different waveforms and different stimulation targets. So where, where the stimulation is delivered really helps address some really key things that these people struggle with, which is tremors, uh, rigidity, um, slowed movement, and a lot of a lot of walking problems. And so the, the technologies help minimize um, the experiences that people have, specifically Parkinson's disease, with our deep brain stimulation uh, technology, uh, to help them live, move, um, and be much more of uh, fit into the community and feel just fundamentally much better about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Heidi, what about Confirm RX? Yeah, so Confirm RX, which is our implantable cardiac monitor we were talking about earlier, brings, uh, uses Bluetooth communication, and that allows the, the implantable cardiac monitor to send data directly to a patient's app which then can get sent to the physician's office. And the benefit that we see with this, in particular to the patient, is that from an outcomes perspective, a health outcomes perspective, their data, along with their documented symptoms on the app, is sent immediately to the physician. And what results in this is the patient doesn't have to be at home. They don't have to drive into the clinic or the office visit to have their device interrogated by the physician. So they get a diagnosis sooner and a more accurate diagnosis because, again, they're taking their app, they're documenting the time that they felt those symptoms, and they're putting in the symptoms that they felt, and that's sent to the doctor's office versus a traditional world of simply saying when, when the physician asks you, well, when did you feel that? And you're trying to remember in your head the date or the time, or you're trying to maintain a diary of your health symptoms. So that's how this technology truly does empower the patient and help the physician diagnose their deadly heart rhythm sooner. Mm -hmm. And Joel, those same benefits uh, seem to be paralleled by the device you mentioned earlier, the Freestyle Libre, um, in terms of taking some of the patient error, and, and I use that term loosely, out of it because the data is captured, the data that, that physicians need to know. There's not an oral transmission. It, the, the objective numbers and information is right there within the device. Yeah, Freestyle Libre has really disrupted the glucose monitoring category completely. Uh, it, it consists of a fully disposable uh, glucose sensor that's worn on the back of the upper arm for up to 14 days. And, and it really solves for two primary problems. Uh, for anyone who has tested their blood glucose using test strips, it's cumbersome, it's painful, it's inconvenient. And because of that, many people don't test as frequently as they should. But with a sensor, like the Freestyle Libre sensor, to get information out of it, you simply hold uh, a handheld device we call the Freestyle Libre Reader or your phone running the Freestyle Libre Link mobile app next to the sensor and in a fraction of a second, you get three pieces of information. You get your current glucose as of that moment in time. You get a trend arrow, which indicates how your glucose is changing 
and you get up to eight hours of glucose history. So you know where you were, where you are, and where you're going. So it's made it effortless to capture dense glucose data. And then the second problem that it solved is really transforming that data into something that's actionable. Because even people who tested frequently using test strips and endured the pain and inconvenience that it comes with, it only provided a discrete value that represented a moment in time. Lastly, uh, more recently, we've introduced uh, a family of digital health tools that really expand the capabilities of the core Freestyle Libre system to mobile medical apps and a cloud-based service, which now allow users to take advantage of a device that they're carrying with them for dozens of other reasons every single day uh, to, to get data out of their sensor uh, that data then gets instantly and automatically uploaded to a cloud-based service known as LibreView, which enables clinicians to uh, access that data on demand in a format that allows them to make much uh, faster and more informed treatment decisions. Uh, Joel, you very casually and appropriately mentioned the device that, that you know is worn on the upper arm. Um, it brings to mind the idea that, that wearable devices, which were foreign or seem foreign, a decade ago are now so casually referred to. The next element may be implantable devices, which was referenced earlier. Um, is there a crossover period where you know, more than half the population is you know, using a wearable or an implantable to, to monitor or improve our health and wellness? Well, in my opinion, that's essentially already started considering how many people use smartphones which, uh, while it's not attached to your body, is something that people carry with them most of the time and access frequently throughout the day. And that's sort of setting the new standard for devices that are really adjacent to that or work in combination with that device, uh, like the Freestyle Libre sensor. So certainly within the, the world of people living with diabetes, sensor-based glucose monitoring is starting to become very mainstream uh, and, and, in my opinion, will will overtake conventional forms of glucose monitoring over the next five years or so. Ryan, do you agree with that assessment and that projection about where we're heading? Yeah, I, do, I agree with Joel You know, completely. I think um, people are continuing to always look at different options, especially when it comes to our area as well as in pain management and the more data and information people have at their fingertips and people have their, their smartphones around, the more we can integrate those with implantable devices that have sensors or wearable sensors. I think we're going to continue to see people take control of their health and really um, improve the outcomes uh, of their health and, and take control. Well, we've spent a lot of time looking backward a bit at the last 10 years or so regarding the evolution in, in digital health. What about the next 10 years or even the next 20 years? Um, question to the entire group. And Heidi, why don't we start with you? Where is this field going? And, and what do we need to bring the innovations that you envision um, and that Abbott envisions to the marketplace where we are all able to experience them? Well, you know, I do see apps as a connectivity tool between people and their healthcare provider and empowering the patient to better manage their own health. And I think this will continue to evolve in new and exciting ways. I also see if a person has multiple medical devices, which we often see in the cardiovascular space, patients actually, uh, most of them do also have diabetes. And as we think about this possibility of apps and technology um, and holistic care, I can see how we have connectivity between these products as well as activity sensors that we have in our devices, as well as understanding heart-healthy nutrition and how all of this can be connected through apps and through smartphones. I also see, and this was mentioned earlier in the discussion, where people are no longer going to have to be traveling um, for their cardiovascular health in their active implantable devices, such as pacemakers and defibrillators. They won't have to travel to the clinic or the hospital to have changes made to the programming of their cardiac device. I can see where we could eventually have remote programming available um, for those patients. And I can see where artificial intelligence starts to play a much larger role in 
bringing better outcomes uh, to patients through data analytics and others where we can understand uh, better how to program our products, how to design our products, and how um, our products can actually improve and save lives in the future. Mm -hmm. Jill, you mentioned a bit about your vision regarding wearables and implantables and and the direction we're heading. Um, Over the next five, 10 years, what else is within your field of vision? Sure. I mean, the the adoption of body-worn sensors will continue to expand. Uh, and like most consumer electronics, you'll see uh, reduction in size, improvement of per- in performance, wearability, uh, all the things that come along with, with volume, scale, and maturity. Uh, so, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, you know, certainly the advancements that we're seeing in machine learning and artificial intelligence represents a lot of potential within healthcare. And, and there's a lot of hype about that right now in, in diabetes. I think there's uh, great potential around it because it's a data intensive disease state. And now we have these types of devices, which make it really effortless to capture that data to transport it to central repositories that then can be used to uh, utilize that data to deliver much more personalized treatment recommendations. Mm -hmm. First to the clinicians that prescribe the devices and help manage and treat the condition, but ultimately maybe to, to the person living with that disease directly. What won't change and what's important for us is to make sure that everything we do is very much user-centered and and putting the the person living with the condition at the center of everything we do. It's sort of the hallmark of what led to Freestyle Libre and why it's been embraced uh, so quickly by the, the patient community. That's been a big, uh, it, it's highlighted the importance of making it user-centered for us. And, and that's a, uh, a pattern now that we will continue. Mm-hmm. Ryan, uh, product development over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, so if you're thinking about, you know, a person who's implanted with a, with a device from Abbott uh, living with chronic pain, that, that device is collecting a vast amount of data. Um, across a number of different parameters and attributes uh, that are really specific to that individual and their use of the therapy. And at Abbott, we're really, we're, because we're the company that can to today leverages um, consumer Bluetooth communication uh, between the implanted device and the user programmer, this capability really is allowing us for seamless transfer of information with our technology. And you can imagine how therapy can be more personalized in the future um, leveraging this data in conjunction with other data sets, um, large population data, physician data, lifestyle, uh, and other attributes. Um, using this data, we can really leverage and set specific and more um, personalized therapies. And so as we think about moving forward beyond that, and we're really looking at smaller, smarter, easier-to-use solutions that allow people to live kind of what their expectations are without us, without the thought that they have chronic pain, without the thought that they have an implanted device. Um, and so that they can really manage their, not just their physical symptoms, but their psychological symptoms. And so, and then in closing, I would say that there's the tech consumer technologies with purpose built AI processors and other things are really going to allow the handhelds to be optimized. Um, so that that person can really enable kind of the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence right there in the palm of their hand, uh, which is really powerful as we think about helping people manage their chronic diseases in the future. Yeah, and I think another factor to consider is the the confluence of AI and the future of healthcare and digital health. And and CES is is such a key element of AI across the show floor and the conversations and everyone who's exhibiting there. but also uh, where it touches upon and intersects with the digital health space. So looking ahead to CES 2020, Joel, you're the CES veteran, at least the most experienced among the group. Uh, How do you describe this um, to to your team back home who doesn't come and and discuss what what digital health is at the show and uh, how prevalent it is there for at least four days? Yeah, I mean... uh 
health and wellness as a category has had a growing presence at CAS, uh, especially over the past five years or so. Uh, when I first started going, uh, you know, it was sort of hidden in, in on the side in one of the smaller exhibit halls. And now the Digital Health Summit is a very prominent part of the overall experience. And we're starting to see the, the lines between, uh, you know, regulated medical devices and health, wellness, lifestyle devices converge. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a fun experience. It's overwhelming, uh, but it, it's definitely uh, worth checking out. And Heidi, this is your first show coming up, CES 2020. What are the veterans, Joel and, and Ryan as well, telling you to expect? I, I, apparently, I should wear my running shoes when I go to the show <laughs> so I have comfort. Getting all of around us, to all of us are nodding different. along. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I actually am excited to to see the latest and greatest in the digital health space and how we can continue to innovate in the healthcare space to bring better outcomes to our patients and better workflow to our physicians. Heidi Heinrichs is with Abbott Cardiovascular. Joel Goldsmith is with Abbott Diabetes Care, and Ryan Lakin is with Abbott Neuromodulation. All of you, thank you for the time and for taking uh, the moments to have a conversation with us from, from various parts around the country. And we look forward to seeing all three of you coming up at CES 2020 in Las Vegas. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for this edition of CES Tech Talk. As always, we want you to be CES ready. So do yourself a favor. Well, you're doing us a favor too, but subscribe to the CES Tech Talk podcast. That way you won't miss a single episode as you're gearing up for CES 2020. Speaking of the big show, you can go to ces.tech, our website, and get the information you need to make your plans for this coming show. It is January 7th through the 10th in Las Vegas. None of this podcast is even remotely possible without our true stars, our executive producer, Tina Anthony, and our senior studio engineer, John Lindsay. Y'all are the very best in the business. I'm Tyler Suters. Let's talk tech again soon.